Welcome back to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. My name is Aaron, and across from me is... The other Aaron! Hello, hi, hey, what's up? I haven't seen you in forever. Hey, what's up? Hello. I know. We haven't done... We were, like, back-to-back with these episodes for very consistently, and then I was out of town, and then you were out of commission, and... I know. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Hello, and welcome back. Hello. Thank you. What I'm... have you been up to since I saw you last? Because it's been a few weeks. Oh, my gosh. I know. Um... We, took a, we didn't take a break in releasing episodes. We took a break in recording episodes for a minute. But tell me about uh, who, who Aaron Cooper is... Uh, I don't know. I, I panic. Uh, Aaron, Tell me what's been going on. I haven't seen it for a minute. <laughs> Aaron Cooper is the same Aaron Cooper in many respects that was here when we last did an episode. Um, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. We had a little bit of a string of intense happenings in my life. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of when it rains, it pours situations. But, of course, having excellent friends like you and our tour stop community and we got through it and things are very exciting and and looking up and I am excited to at some point have some free time to actually sit my butt at a swimming pool and (laughs) roast in the sun because that hasn't been able to happen yet well it was hot enough for it yesterday I know. I was on my couch editing videos for 18 hours. Boo. I know. We need like a boo sound effect. I watched four movies last night. One of them was, oh, Benchwarmers. I watched the Benchwarmers. Gus. Bus. Bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watched the Benchwarmers last night. Yeah. I was talking with uh, with a friend of mine about that movie yesterday, and it inspired me. So I literally was like, Okay, I have to watch this movie. So I started looking on all of the streaming platforms, Mm -hmm. and I literally got an HBO Max subscription to watch that one movie. Wow, I've I've been there. I've been there. I did that. I I was on a mission. See, mine was on a much different uh, spectrum, but I did that to watch the Michael Jackson documentary, Leaving Neverland. Uh, Obviously, I've never seen that. Is it good? It is the best documentary I've ever seen for all of the most tragic reasons. Big words coming from someone who's seen a lot of stuff. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it truly is just the way the producers and the filmmakers told the story and ordered the story, but also in which the victims um, just presented their their story as well but if you are a huge michael jackson fan like myself the allegations made against michael jackson uh and the detail will ruin your life it oh. it, 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 it it was so Woof. compelling and it just when you kept thinking it couldn't get worse it did yikes <laughs> So uh, there's a little bit of a there's your there's your disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. If you don't want to ruin the magic. Yeah. Well, how, OK. How have you been, Mr. Shilb? Let's see. I had my head cut open. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Let's just not <laughs> breeze over that. That kind of <laughs> happened. Yeah. So for those of you who've been listening to the podcast for a while or are fans of me in any respect of what I have done in my life, I have lost most of my hearing and both of my ears. Woof. But uh, in April, which is part of why we took a break from recording, mm-hmm. is because I had surgery on my left ear and had a cochlear implant uh, installed. And I'm part robot now. Yes, I've made that joke to you many times that you are a robot now. I've been making that joke for like a decade about how I'm dead inside because oh. uh, I've never been in love. But uh. now I'm even more of a robot because I have a actual like... I have a magnet in my head now. Like, I can't get an MRI. I mean, some pff, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, some people would argue that you could have been a robot before with your hearing aids just because they were like a mechanical right. thing. But I, th- I think you're actually a robot because they cut you open and put something in you. Oh, yeah. Here. Do you want to see the scar? Yeah. Let's do this on the air. Hold on. I'm okay. going to move my mic out of the way. Ah, is this scary? Check it out. Wait, that's like not that terrifying. Okay, that's healed really well. Oh, thank you for not shrieking in terror. Well, I'm not a I'm not a blood girl. I'm not I'm like not a, a blood guy either. So I was like, ah, oh. but I mean, it's been what like a month? It's been three days shy of a month since I had that happen. Wow! And look how far you've come. I don't know. I know that you were definitely recovering and going through it for a couple of days, as anyone definitely. would. Definitely. Um, But I would have to say, I think your recovery has been rather uh, 
good, quick. I mean, question mark. I, I mean, you you are just such a go getter and just a can't stay down for too long kind of person. So that makes sense. But I feel like you weren't out of commission for. I was down for about. I, I gave myself a hard seven days before I sure. went back out into the world. But day eight, I was back at a show. Describe, okay, journalist Aaron is emerging. Um, <laughs> here she comes. Uh, describe what... They did? Well, I mean, yes, what they did, but also, like, what the physical and mental feelings have been as a result of this procedure for someone that has no grasp of so, this. for those of you, maybe even you, yeah. who don't know what a cochlear implant is, there's two parts of it. There's the inside part, and then there's the outside part. Uh Back in April, they installed the inside part, and that's where they cut open behind your ear, and they drill through your skull Ugh. into your inner ear, where Ugh. your cochlea is, oh. and the cochlea is about, about the size of a pea or something, I think. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's super small, mm -hmm. and it's shaped like a cinnamon roll, and they drill into that and oh. thread an electrode through it into the cinnamon roll-shaped thing, and then that electrode leads to the giant, like metal thing outside my head you felt that right yeah it's huge it's a it's like i i, I shit you not it's probably like three like the if you stack three quarters on top of each other it's like that thick it's like oh, underneath wow. my skin now yeah. and then right next to it is uh something i can't feel but is a magnet that uh connects to the outside part Wow. Which the outside part then has the thing that goes over my ear that looks like a gigantic hearing aid. Yeah. And then it's got a little coil that goes to the magnet. So the big outside part has the battery that connects to the magnet and the magnet powers the inside part. It's science. Okay. Follow-up questions to this. Okay. <laughs> so first, not really a question, just a more of a, an observation. It is so incredible that you understand so thoroughly what is now happening to you science Science, yes but i just feel like as humans we are so under educated about our own bodies in many different ways and when it comes to that's for sure having things done to our bodies that we don't understand <laughs> or that you weren't conscious for happening the fact that you are able to understand and describe exactly what's happened is very impressive and very important so i'm very happy about that for you um, Follow-up questions include, if someone sticks a magnet to your head, <laughs> is that harmful? Like, no. okay, does it hurt? No, no? it doesn't okay. hurt, but I think you saw that photo I put on my Instagram story where I just stuck a refrigerator magnet to my head. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's just a new party trick I can do. The other follow-up question is, wh how different is your day to day now. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but if you want to describe to your comfort level of like what you're currently navigating. I mean, my day to day really hasn't changed as far as like just what I do for work and like where I go and what I do. The biggest thing that's changed is literally how I hear. Mm -hmm. So cochlear implants don't hear like, like you and I would normally hear like, I don't want to say you and I, how you yeah, with regular <laughs> functioning ears hear. <laughs> um, so with regular hearings called acoustic hearing, there's like pitch and inflection and dynamic for volume and all of these things that give you, Aaron Cooper, your personality with your voice. Ah, okay, yes. <laughs> but with the cochlear implant, because it's so robotic, if you will, uh, it flattens everything. So I basically have to go get speech therapy to learn how to hear with it. Oh. So... What it sounds like to me right now is like uh, stadium lights buzzing. Wow. Yeah, so it kind of sounds like that. It kind of sounds like a child's toy megaphone that you talk into and it makes your voice turn into a robot. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of also sounds like an old-timey telephone ringing, like the, what is it, the dial tone trill. Yeah. Kind of sounds like that, but really high-pitched. And that's constant. Constant. All so, the time. So right now. Yes. Even right now as we speak. Have you been able, like, d does it register? Are you conscious of it all the time? Or is it only if you kind of, like, tap into it and you think about it? I'm conscious of it all the time. So there's a bunch of different steps of having a cochlear implant and literally just getting it installed. And then they call it activating, which is when they give you the outside part. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, like 
literally like day one of like relearning how to hear. So you have to go to speech therapy and you have right. to go to what's called mapping, which is where they uh, pick and choose what you can and can't hear. And they change the frequencies uh, according to the device that you can't hear. So they program it so that you can hear those things. So like right now I can hear water running so I can hear the shh sound, but I can't hear vowels so i can't hear a e i o u that all sounds the same i simply cannot wrap my mind around this it's crazy and you've explained this to me before but every time you explain it it does not get easier for me to comprehend so i can't imagine how challenging or exhausting this can be for you at times it's very exhausting so i mean the day after i or the day i got it was like traumatic of course. i was i was just like in shock about what it was because I had all these expectations of what it was going to sound like. Yeah. But uh, clearly didn't meet my expectations. But I mean, it all, uh, I'm, I'm getting more used to it now that it, okay. that I've just had it on for um, two weeks now or so, something like that. But yeah, it's definitely still really weird and definitely will take a lot of getting used to. I have to keep basically a dream journal <laughs> of what I can and can't hear. Okay, do you turn it off, quote unquote, when you sleep? Yeah, so I just disconnect the outside part for the magnet. Okay. And the inside part doesn't do anything without the outside part. So yeah, I just take the outside part and it's got a little dehumidifier case that I put it in overnight. How does this affect how you experience or play music and or shows? I am tone deaf right now. Entirely? In my, in my left ear. Okay. I mean, my right ear hears the same as it always has. Yeah. But yeah, my left ear has no pitch recognition right now. And will it ever? A friend of mine named Zoe Nutt, shout out. She mm -hmm. played tour stop not too long ago. She has a cochlear implant. She says she can hear pitch, but it's like if you play a piano when there's or an orchestra where there's a whole bunch of different notes happening all at the same time, that sounds a lot more jumbled. But if there's like a single note or something not as cluttered, it's a, you, she can hear the pitch of it. Okay. So like every now and then when I'm watching TV at home, I can hear a couple of notes in the theme song of a TV show or something. But like, if you just play a melody on a piano right now, it would be really hard for me to sing it back to you or impossible for me to sing it back to you. Wow. But yeah. okay, so you played your first show in quite a while a few nights ago. Yeah, so that was uh, Thursday at Tennessee Brew Works. I played the Birds of a Feather Round. Wow. Yeah, that's so... run by Lauren Freebird. Caca. I don't know. I'm sure that's not Lauren Freebird's no, thing. No, not but at I all. Just, but I just she's, uh, to she's 17. She goes to some school in uh, Mount Juliet. She's in high school, but she's dope. She runs Amazing. around there on Thursday nights. That's so cool. Yeah, so, she's super cool. So that was your first round with this new robotic element to your life. <laughs> um, how how did it go? It was fun. Okay. It was really weird because I haven't played in two and a half months. Yeah. I haven't played since... Uh, since the beginning of March when we had some venue changes for tour stop. And I just kind of took myself out of the equation of playing altogether. Sure. And then it just occurred to me, it's like, oh, crap, I don't have anything <laughs> scheduled to play. Yeah. So it was really fun. I, I do miss performing, but it's been good to kind of have some distance from it. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I had tried performing the day I got this, it would have been a nightmare. I bet. Yeah, so I, when, when I performed last week, I was literally just using my right ear, which still hears pitch and volume and dynamic and everything. Would it almost be easier when you're performing to turn off your cochlear implant so you don't have that interference and you can I just... I could, okay. but the, uh, the audiologists say to leave it in all the time, otherwise you'll never adjust. adjust. So basically sure. leaving it on is even subconsciously like reprogramming my brain to tell... It, that what I hear with my good ear, my right ear, and what I hear with my bad ear, my left ear, is the same. So it's like reprogramming my brain to tell it that those two sounds are the same. Sure. So then when you're in a loud environment, because I remember right after you got it, you would text me and be like, it's so loud, like wherever I am. Um, is When you're like at shows or you're in a loud environment, is it overwhelming? Does your implant quote unquote, react differently. So part of the reason it's loud is because there were so many, or it was loud, it was because there were so many settings on it that I didn't know how to control it. Okay. It was on, it was set to literally like 500% volume, which is part of why it was too loud. Yeah. I have since figured out. Coming from to, a deaf guy, when something's too loud, that's a. Uh... <laughs> I made a complaint to an old apartment uh, landlord because my upstairs neighbor was being so loud I could hear him. 
and I complained and she's like, oh, well, can you just like ask him to be quiet? And I was like, you don't understand how loud someone has to be for me to hear them. Yeah. And she's like, what do you mean? And I took out my hearing aids and I was like, I'm deaf. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I will, I will speak with your neighbor. <laughs> I was like, thank you. Oh my yeah. Gosh. So it's been a really weird adjustment, but uh, it's coming along every now and then I can pick out a few words that, that I hear with it, but I do have to go to speech therapy and that's, that's normal. They say it takes about six months before you can really start recognizing things. So with all the different set or not settings, the different steps of having it, there's like the first one is recognizing that there is sound and that happens immediately mm -hmm. when you plug it in. And that's recognition of sound is just the buzzing and whatever, like I just mentioned, the dial tone. It's literally recognizing that there is a sound. The second step is being able to discern what that sound is. And that's what I have a really hard time with now so like a bird chirping and you talking and a guitar playing three very different things all sound the same to me right now so to recap and bundle up everything you've described i'm going to regurgitate and i want you to tell me if this is right <laughs> okay. okay so cochlear implant ear yes is seeing in black and white yes other ear is seeing in color great idea great way to put it amazing great okay. way to put it um and in essence, both of your ears, so to speak, are functioning very differently at the same time yes. on each half of your head. Yeah, it's very, very different hearing two different ways at the same time. That's incredible. Yes, and it's bonkers. Wow. Well, I just did an entire interview for Aaron Schilb's <laughs> cochlear implant update. I could sit here all day and ask you questions. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Definitely something that we'll, we'll be talking about probably a lot over the next six months about just how how it's going and everything. But I go back in a couple of weeks for yeah. this first uh, audiology mapping quote, mm -hmm. end quote. <laughs> Is it quote, end quote, quote? Un I've heard people say quote, unquote. Yeah, quote, unquote. Oh. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> quote, quote, I forgot what I was saying. What was what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> so you're, about how you're going to be going to. Oh, yeah, I'll be going to the yeah. I'll be going to the audiologist for these. Uh, they're called mapping appointments, and that's where you tell them what you can't hear, what you can't understand, and they program the device. So every subsequent time I go back, I will be able to hear better in sure, theory sure. because I will have recognized like things I can't hear. Like I can hear water running. Um, I can't hear you talk. Or I can hear Brian Griffin's voice on Family Guy, <laughs> but I can't hear anyone else. It's very weird. Wow. Oh, man, I'm glad we finally got to catch up because it's been a minute since we've had had time to just sit down and shoot the shit, so to speak. I know. I know. I see you out and about always, right? But it's, we're always at shows engaging with our friends and paying attention to the music that's being played. So I know. Uh, so Sunday the 29th, we have a show at the basement with Hugh G, Clover James, and Weston. Wow. That's going to be such a good show. It's going to be a great show. Those three guys sold it out last year. So Oh, let's go. Yeah, it's going to be dope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but uh, come to that show if you're listening to this uh, before Sunday the 29th. Yes. If you're listening to this after Sunday the 29th, it was dope. Yeah, regardless of what actually <laughs> happened, it was amazing. Yeah, last year when we did this show, it was June 30th, 2021. Uh, the basement sold out. And then we oversold out. So there were 177 people there. And I got a call about an hour before the show started. And the talent buyer there was like, hey, do you have a box fan? And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, I have one for my apartment. Why? What's up? And he's like, yeah, so our air conditioning went out. Oh, this is what everyone's been talking about with the air conditioning going out. Yeah. So the air conditioning went out <laughs> for the biggest show of the year there. 177 people inside there. And... It was hotter inside than it was in the middle of a Tennessee summer outside. Well, that is really saying something because for Brandon Ellis's show last what what is now today's of the of this filming right, a week like the last basement show, it was so hot. I was literally barely wearing any clothes and it was so hot in there and it was, you know, not sold out. So right. I can't imagine 177 people in there, period. Like, let I alone. didn't even know where my sweat started and where my spilled beer uh, like ended. That is uh, a beautiful sentiment right there. Wow. I was talking to Tori Grace the other day Love her. Um, and she tweeted something about how 
when people use the word naked in their songs, it makes her super uncomfortable. And like Alicia Pace's song, Naked and Lazy. Love and that song. The shout out Alicia Pace. We love that song. Alicia. But uh, Tori was saying about all these songs with the word naked in it makes her feel super awkward. So I uh, tweeted back to her something that I knew would make her equally hate the word naked. But I was like, hmm, I think I need to write a song. Uh, gosh, here, this is what uh, the original tweet from Tori said. Okay, guys, new rule. Please stop using the word naked in your song lyrics because it makes everyone feel weird and uncomfy. And I said, how about he looked naked in his moist khaki pants? And Tori said, I'm going to barf. <laughs> oh, gosh. What were the circumstances to make said individual's khaki pants moist? I don't want to know. Yeah, uh, hard pass on. Uh, Apparently the air conditioning going out at the basement in a sold-out <laughs> show. Well, hey, since we've uh, reached the moist khaki pants part of our show today, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll come <laughs> right back with the Nashville Tour Stop we gotta Podcast. we got to unmoist the pants. <laughs> to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. You are on air with Aaron on this side of the table, and on the other side... You are in your car. I don't know. What? I don't have a sign-on. You, your sign-on... We talked about this in a previous episode. Oh, we did talk your, about your this sign on, on <laughs> Your sign-on is when you sign us on to, to the start show. the episode, but... Welcome back, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> there we go. Amazing. Well, we spent the first portion of this episode talking about Aaron's new robotic hearing experience that is fascinating altogether that I will never never be able to grasp. However, we also started kind of uh, inching towards the topic of how you experience shows with this new development in your life. Right. And because we both have different music industry lenses, so to speak, about shows in general, be it, you know, small venues or arenas or whatever, I think it's cool to talk about topics that we can both shed opinions on, but obviously they're different. So I thought for the second half of this episode, we could talk about our perspectives on experiencing live music, whether it's in Nashville, you know, what we like about it, what makes for a good show, bad show. So I think like, I, we were talking about this a little bit before we were recording about how, like, I have a couple of different perspectives from this because I come from, like, being a performer originally, mm -hmm. and I have gone to see, at this point in my life, like, hundreds of concerts, but um, I, I get to watch it from two different kind of angles because I get to watch it as a performer and, like, a fan of music, mm -hmm. but then uh, I get to also watch it as a business person who works in the music industry, and uh, sometimes those lines kind of bleed together, mm -hmm. but it's hard for me to turn off the business brain. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'll go to watch a show or I'll, like, analyze a lineup or be like, so why did these people get paired together? Or, like, why did they pick this venue? And there's, like, a thousand questions running through my head all the time. So it's sometimes it's really hard to just go watch my friend's band and be like, oh, my God, Brandon Ellis. <laughs> I love you. Uh, well, that is certainly my reaction every time I every see Brandon Ellis perform. You got the magic. Da, 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 da. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, when I... The way I've experienced concerts has really changed but also stayed the same. And what I mean by that is growing up, you know, I've been going to concerts since I was seven years old. My first right. one was Shania Twain at the what is now the Capital One Center in D.C. And, of course, I was always just a crazy, upbeat fan of music, and that's all there was to it. And then... Well, I started playing music because I grew up playing music and I could kind of understand and appreciate other aspects in that way. Um, I never played music to the degree of which you and right. our friends play, um, but I could understand certain things. And then when I became a storyteller, my the way I view a show, I would not say is through the business side or even really through, you know, just the musicality aspect of things. It is the bird's eye view encompassing of the entire experience. You know, a, a big thing for me is how 
the artist is doing as a general term, but then also how they're engaging with the crowd. A big thing that I do with the radio station right. is that we do sort of recap videos of the shows that come through Nashville, and it's all fan focused and their experience and we focus in on the style and the stories of individual fans who come to the show and why they're there and how everyone is connecting at the show and it doesn't seem to matter where I am physically in the show that's something I always have my head on a swivel for is is this person enjoying it how is this person reacting is the person on stage engaging I watch a lot of that too at, especially at tour stop shows is because I want to make sure that like the people who are actually there are having a good time because I mean who cares if the band rocks if the people in the audience don't care it doesn't matter right because I mean we see people every day in this town who are like amazing musicians but that's part of why like if you watch so much music at all it, it, it kind of homogenizes right you you start seeing so many bands and you're like okay they all sound the same they all look the same everything is the same so then it's hard to like differentiate between like what makes this person so to speak like quote better generally aaron have you noticed anything different when it comes to live shows either in how people act during them both fans and artists pre and post pandemic have you seen a shift in how shows are done or experienced in general um i've seen i mean as far as i've been involved in the industry like people always concern 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 concern, concern, concern. <laughs> <laughs> they, they always consume the shows like they'll watch it with their eyes but then they're also going to watch it through their phone like in front of their face as they oh, tell yeah. people on uh, Snapchat and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That they're watching the show. Yeah. People, people want to be seen doing things. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it, it's good to see people sharing the show because you want people to know that it's happening. But it's also like, man, just put that in your pocket. And yeah. L watch this song. It is so funny you mentioned this because I was watching the 2008 Jonas Brothers concert experience <laughs> on, uh, I guess it was Netflix when I was home with my family a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that jumped out to me the most is, yes, this concert was from 2008. And when you looked into the crowd in this arena show, there were no phones. Everyone was watching. There was maybe like a handful of flip phones where people were maybe taking, taking like super low res photos. One, one megapixel. <laughs> yes. And then a few like of the, you know, little digital cameras, you know, like Nikons or whatever that yeah. people would bring. But there were no, you know, I mean, I'm holding my phone up in the office right now, but like there was no <laughs> people just holding their phones up recording the whole concert. Have you ever been to those concerts or like comedy shows where they make you put your phone in the little uh, bag that only opens up with a magnet? That time we went to Zany's. Yeah. 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 So uh, <laughs> I've started seeing uh, some concert venues doing that Yeah. where they make you put your phone in the thing. Yeah. And I get it at comedy shows because they don't want people to like – share the jokes the comedians are telling yeah but also like it it live shows like for music i think it'd be equally cool to do that because you'll enjoy it more exactly it's you know i i reached a point not too long ago where if i go to shows i will not record anything I will not take photos right. because I am there. I love music so much and I'm there to experience it. And I don't, A, I don't want to watch it through my phone. B, I know I'm not, did I say A or one? Did I say A and then B? I thought I said like one B. <laughs> one B, uh, Zeta. Z yeah. So B, I know I'm not going to go back and watch the videos. Right. And, oh, totally. Yeah. And C, I don't want to distract the people behind me or block the view of the people behind me. However, I, as I say this, as I say that I go to these shows and I really don't, maybe I'll take like a photo, right? right? But now with Hot 1067, when I go to these shows, I am literally there to cover it and to bring content to people who can't be so there. So you're always on your device. So I'm always on my device. And it's like, it doesn't, it does not impact my experience because I'm still having a great time right. and I still am able to enjoy. And my phone isn't, I'm not sitting there like the whole time with my phone, but 
I all I, I do get a little bit of like, are these people thinking that I'm just another one of those millennials <laughs> that like is just recording the you whole concert for no reason? You should get a shirt that no says, reason. I'm working right now. I'm <laughs> not playing on my phone. Where, where that's every, exactly. Because, you know, and it's rewarding to then take those videos because I actually do make something with them. The back of your shirt can <laughs> say, I'm sorry, my phone is in front of you. L- literally. <laughs> so, you know, that's definitely something that I try to be conscious of when I'm not working. It's like, nah, I don't take my phone out. But when I am, I'm making something cool for people who couldn't be there to see. That's so, cool. Yeah. And that's one reason I do like getting to have people who are designated to create things like that is because there's people who definitely did want to see those shows but uh, couldn't, for one factor or another, be present. So it's cool being able to do that, but it doesn't ever defeat the fact that being at a concert and being present at a concert will always be better. Exactly. Now, speaking of phones and looking at one's phone, I know that there is, you know, always an ongoing debate about. I don't like using the word TikTok artists because I feel by even just saying that it is giving them a bad rap. Right. Um, Because I don't feel that way. Um, I personally know many TikTok artists that are what people claim they are not to be. Um, (laughs) which is very talented, compelling, engaging artists. Would you say, what is your opinion on those, or your opinion on how some say, oh, these people that got famous on a digital platform aren't going to be able to bring compelling live shows when the time comes? You know, like, there, there is definitely a trend of the TikTok artist happening right now, but uh, I think that it's just that. I think it's a trend, it's like there there will always be, and as there always has been, there will always be the musicians who are on stage that are entertainers first to an audience. And it's one thing being able to create a 20-second video that's funny and 10 million people watch around the world, but how many of those 10 million people are actually going to come to your show in Nashville, Tennessee? Mm-hmm. And that's what I have to look at as a promoter is like, cool, you have – a million TikTok followers. That's dope. You have a huge reach. You can be an influencer. Cool, whatever. But it's like, I don't know if you're going to play a show and if 20 people are even going to come because I don't know if all of your followers are in New York or LA or Tokyo. Yeah. So I've got to be really careful about working with TikTok artists in particular because I have done that Mm -hmm. and it's gone over well. But then I've also done it times where it's been a disaster. Right. And therein lies, you know, I'm so glad you brought up that perspective because that's not one I've really thought about from a promoter standpoint. And it's also, you know, obviously what someone likes about a live show is always going to be subjective. But at the same time, you know, is there something to be said about, yes, this person has a good voice. Yes, this person is good looking or people enjoy looking at, but can they bring not even just the numbers of people, but can they create a compelling performance? Because right. there there are plenty of artists that, you know, they get on stage, they sit on a stool and they sing their set and then that's it. And people like that. And then there are people that are performers that engage with the crowd. Maybe they dance, maybe they don't, maybe they play instruments. So that's interesting to think about too. Like but- how many times have you started making a TikTok video and restarted it 12 times because you didn't get the right shot? I feel like oh. it's a lot harder to, I mean, you can't do that if you're, on stage with a band you can't be like all right we got to play this song again it didn't go well yeah i mean i say that i have had people literally restart their songs with their bands because they someone played a wrong chord someone sang the wrong words and i'm like this isn't tiktok you don't get to do that again there's an audience here waiting to be entertained and you're ruining their experience by not being prepared as all of the other bands uh, for a show right And then you have artists that entirely break that mold. I'll give a shout out to Tate McRae, who is a very established and uh, relatively new um, pop artist now. Um, And she was she kind of rose to her recent fame on TikTok. But she is Gail. Gail is also in that. Yes. Um, Tate McRae, for instance, she is an insanely professionally trained dancer. And she bangs out an incredible live show. And she has killer vocals and great music. And I saw her live. And she does have – I mean, she sold out uh, the basement, East. Mm -hmm. And then 
Gail, who I've also worked with, she's incredible. You've you're right. very familiar with her, and kind of the same thing happened with her. But she is incredible at ga- engaging with an audience, and she can captivate a crowd. I think part of that because comes because Gail was playing live long before TikTok was a thing. Like For sure, she was, she was playing tour stop shows in 2017. Yeah, um, and I I mean I saw her play at Alley Taps a ton because she used to be part of Spencer Jordan's rounds too, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it's just like I think that helps having the background in live performance because you don't forget how to do that. Mm-hmm. You, like you can learn to be a TikTok entertainer as well. But as long as you have that live yeah. thing, whatever you want to call it, people will always be able to fall back, so to speak, on that. Yeah. Well, wow. we did it. <laughs> we did it. OK, so let's keep this one uh, short and sweet before we uh, banter too much because I know we have a way of. We just always getting have lost to talk in a about. conversation. Yeah. Okay. Give us your plugs. All right. I am on air with Aaron everywhere you engage on the interwebs, and that is Aaron with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron with a Y. You can follow me on uh, social media at the Aaron Shilb. You can also listen to me on my podcast, Selective Listening, where I sit and drink beer with my guests. Yeah. And talk about anything. Honestly, the only the only pointed question I ever ask people is what they're listening to oh oh i know right wow. but so it's meta. also because of my deaf yes of your <laughs> the the whole joke on the disability <laughs> bringing it full circle three oh i thought you said three full circles i was like this this isn't the olympics which is five i don't know yes we're getting outside of the thing <laughs> uh but you can uh follow us on national tour stuff Dot com that'll keep up with our full show schedule you can follow our show on national tour stop uh instagram or tiktok i think we're like five followers away from having a thousand followers on tiktok we can go live that'll be exciting but until then please remember that all roads lead right back here to the nashville, nashville tour, tour stop. stop yeehaw motherfucker <laughs> <laughs>